The mic works. Whoa. Turn that level down a little bit. Turn that way down. Way. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. There you go. I want to make sure people on the hallway hear me. Yeah. Go. I want to borrow my mic? We apologize, we've hacked the microphone system. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Dennis Hurst. I'm with the HP Enterprise Security Group. Um, I'm gonna be introducing RAF Lowe's today. So um, I've actually known RAF since 2002, I think. 2002. When uh, we were way, way, way back when we were first developing WebInspect, uh, RAF was one of our first customers out at GE and uh, we've been friends and coworkers for the, about the past decade now. So it's, it's my pleasure to introduce RAF. Uh, he's going to be talking about some application security issues. So uh, I just wanted to come in and say thank you very much for attending. And Raf, thanks, guys. Hello. Give me the big room. That's awesome. So uh, the I'm gonna take this up. Oh God, that's heavy. So the uh, the talk, my talk this afternoon is uh, it's called "You're Gonna Need a Bigger Shovel." Anybody want to guess why? So this is basically a, a critical look at software security assurance uh, as a practice, as a model, as something you've implemented or tried and failed, and uh, as, as something that we have been trying to figure out how to do correctly since I've, right before I got to know Dennis, so eh, about 12, 13 years for a while now. Uh, this is how to catch more information from me. I run a podcast. I run a blog. Um, I ramble on a Twitter stream every once in a while. Um, I encourage you to give the podcast a listen because it's actually some really interesting people. I don't talk much, so I'll save you that. But we have a lot of great people that are on that show for 30 minutes at a time every two weeks, and we talk about issues that you probably care about. So uh, just by show of hands, anybody want to admit to being in the blue? It's OK. You don't have to admit to it. Um, so there's three types of organizations. There's those that get software security assurance, that actually understand the principles and uh, and, and trouble and all the implementations behind it. Uh, those that are fooling themselves into thinking they get it. And then there's the rest of everybody else who's just spending lots and lots of money and getting very low return on that. Okay. And so I wanted to talk about what software security assurance is versus what application security is. You guys, we've started using the terms interchangeably. Uh, application security isn't software security assurance, actually. Uh, they're not the same thing. Application security, when we talk about it, what's the first thing that pops to mind? Anybody? Lively crowd. Try again. Anybody? Right. Scanning, cross-site scripting, all those types of things that are very technical. Something I, I can take a app I can buy something to make it go away generally, right? Or I can try. Um, software security assurance is a little bit different, right? When we look at software security assurance, what we're thinking and talking about is all the things that make up something strategic longer term that has a much greater impact than a single point in time. It's like the impact of a program versus an audit. So application security is, it tends to talk about securing software, using tools and technology, uh, things that do a specific purpose, that serve a specific purpose. And application security, the highest you can probably ever measure that is at the CISO level. We talk about how, how well we can measure something. Okay. Software security assurance, on the other hand, is a program approach driven by risks. Uh, I like to think about it as a way of looking at things. And if anybody saw John's uh, Stevens presentation earlier, it's about modeling what you're up against and then figuring out rational solutions to that that sometimes involve buying things, sometimes involve changing culture, sometimes involve everything you can possibly think of and then some. And it's actually measured much differently. It's measured at the chief information officer or chief technology officer. Or if you get really lucky, you can measure it at like the chief uh, CFO, chief risk officer level. But it's measured much more highly than just the technology stack. And people process always come first in, in the software security assurance model. This is contrary to what you've heard from many vendors. Right? It, buying something and pointing a scanner at something or having an application scanned and assessed 
doesn't actually make you any more secure in the long run. I uh, had a great uh, conversation with an information security officer at a um, rather large auto company that likened application security, modern application security, to crash testing cars. He says, what we try to do, or what I see my security teams trying to do, bless you, is they repeatedly crash cars and they wonder why they're not any safer. Does that make sense to anybody? So there's a couple of steps to every good software security assurance program. And if you're not taking them in this kind of stride, in this sort of, in this methodology, in this way, odds are you're going to get to an, you're never going to reach a state where you're actually happy. And you're going to continue on what we've long termed as the hamster wheel of pain here in security, where you spend more and you throw more at it and you do more, but you still get hacked. So you spend more and you spend more time and you hire more people and you still get hacked. And it's this downward spiral. It, it has to stop. And so, Step one is obviously assessment. Knowing where you are, some sort of situational awareness of what you've walked into, what you've stepped out onto. And I call it a rational assessment because we need to really put, take off these sort of rosy colored glasses, I think, in information security. We've, we've continued to, I still meet people every day that sort of make fun of their developers, how, how stupid their users are, and how they just don't get it. And then you want to go, OK, well, can you go write their code better? And they go, well, no, I can break it. That's great. I can go smash a window, too. What does that get me? Right? I'm really high up on this breaker builder model. I like to have more builder interaction, more glorifying of the people that actually solve problems versus the ones that create more of them. And it's all important, and I get it, it's important to highlight where the bugs are, where the problems are, highlight where the dead bodies are, but really, if you're not helping anybody solve it, are you any less of the problem? So it's a rational assessment of capabilities, resources, assets, liabilities, organizational uh, structure, and the most important thing on that list is your organizational goal. How many of you guys here in the room that work for a company, not a vendor, can articulate the top three or any of the board level requirements or mandates from your organization? If you cannot, what are you trying to accomplish? And if you say security, we can have a really fun conversation about what does that mean. If you don't have a goal to which, to which you are aspiring, what are you aspiring to? You're aspiring to a mythical state of security that does not exist. And this is why we get into that downward spiral of spending more and still getting hacked. Right? The budgets in information security and in, uh, application security continue to increase year over year. Actually, that's the fastest growing part of information security is the budgets for software security. Are we getting any better at application security? That answer is really easy. No, we're not. We're still getting hacked. So what does that mean? And uh, a colleague of mine, Eric, was, uh, is a chief risk officer now at a very large company. And he always starts off conversations with people he doesn't know in situations like this. And he asks the people that work for him, if you are not helping my company succeed, then you're hindering progress. So how are you, what are you doing to, to help that, further that along? So let me give you a concrete example here, because it's kind of esoteric terms here. Say you work for a hospital. What do hospitals care about? Survivability, does that make sense? How many people they don't, they, they basically convert from, uh, you know, <laughs> being on the precipice of death, to walking out of the hospital happily, right? There's, there's, a, there's a specific, and it's really kind of morbid, but there's a specific number of, and metrics behind how many people walk into, a, uh, or are wheeled into a hospital trauma unit, how many of them are expected to make it and how many of them aren't. Goals in an organization like that, from that viewpoint, has nothing to do with security, if you don't think about it correctly. What they think about is, we need to increase that survivability rate by 2%. So software security group, what are you doing about that? And we look at them like, 
I don't know, nothing. What do we have to do with that? We're securing your company. And we wonder why nobody gets us. Right? But the light bulb has to go on at some point. You have to connect the dots. If you're going to do an assessment, you have to be careful of what I call, everybody talks about paralysis by analysis. You can keep doing an analysis and you keep being more thorough and more thorough and more thorough. But if your analysis takes two years, what you started analyzing has probably changed and is no longer valid. And your end state, your result is no longer valid. Also, the idea that you want to be thorough enough to where you un can understand the problem, but you have to move fast enough to have something actionable that comes out of that. And so step two of this is resource planning. If you're going to set up a software security program, you have to have resources. This is sort of a no-brainer. However, it's not the kind of no-brainer that you think. So resources. What can you do with what you already have? There's different types of resources in your organization. There's technology. There's the people aspect. There's also this thing called time and capital. If you've ever heard somebody talk about, do you guys remember when pen tests were like the thing to do or be a pen tester was the thing to do? Because everybody, why were people doing pen tests so much? Because they were going to get the hacker's eye view, right? In air quotes, hacker's eye view of the applications that they wanted to test. Why is that a completely false premise? Anybody want to guess? Be right, you're time boxed. You're time constrained. How many hackers that try to get into, name the multi-global bank, doesn't matter, right? That are trying to break into that bank are going to say, I'm only going to work for 40 hours. I'm going to scope myself to, oh, 30, 38 hours for the attack, two hours for the report. And I'm only going to do it during off-peak hours. And I'm going to make sure not to hit any critical assets because we don't want to kill business. But isn't that what we do during most pen tests? I mean, yes, the really good ones actually take those rules out. But how many executives are happy about that? What if you break something? Then you break something. But so planning for resource allocation, it's kind of interesting. I, I've worked with a bunch of uh, large companies that start t talking and thinking about software security insurance programs in a long term. And their long term is five years. Like, man. I don't know what, the, what anything's going to look like in five years. I mean, we used to try to prognosticate that far out. We've all been wrong, every single one of us. Man, three years out is a little tough to guess. Why don't we look at this? More importantly, if you're going to set up a security program that you're going to implement over the course of five years, do you have any idea what the technology landscape in, in the global political landscape, the technology landscape is going to look like in five years? I don't. We might have brain implants by then, and our computers might be in our heads. I mean, I, I don't know. The threat landscape completely changes by the time you get to that point, right? So we've got to look at some rational timelines. 6, 12, 18, 36 months, tops. If you get out to 36 months, the further out you go, the more theoretical you have to be. Does that make sense? You can't say in 36 months, I'm going to be analyzing these, this struts code with this tool and these three people. Because those three people probably won't work for you. If this is security, we know people change. That tool will probably go, have gone through 27 iterations, or be gone in some cases. And you're probably not coding in that same framework anymore. And if you are, then you're now considered legacy. Right? So these are all these important things. I love it when information security groups try to tackle software security, and they fight hard. And they get put center stage of their company. And then those two ga resources, gals, guys, whatever, end up going, yes. As of tomorrow, the CIO said every app that gets released has to go through us. And then tomorrow comes. And they got 74 emails in their inbox that says all these have to be analyzed by Monday. You wanted it. Now what? You fail by success. You can actually open the dam too wide. And then what happens? Then you have to go tell the big boss that, well, OK, I can handle one app per five days. I know there's 74 in the queue, but I can't handle them all. And they go, OK, well, so some of them get to bypass you? How does this work? Who determines that? 
and all of a sudden now you've got a bypass switch and it just gets ugly, right? Then everybody bypasses you. Will you insource, outsource, or do a hybrid of the two? If you're insourcing, it means you're going to try to train people. How long does it take to ramp that program up? Does it take two, a year to train everybody, to hire them, to bring them up to speed on your technology? By the way, by now it's all changed. Start, try again, start over. Are you going to outsource? Are you going to let the people that write your source code also do the analysis of it? This is called the fox guarding the hen house. There are lots of organizations that I can name firsthand that do work with the banking system that the company, the offshore company that happens to write their code is also tasked with doing the security analysis of it. Is nobody besides me see a conflict of interest there? Of course it's secure. Why would we write insecure code? If you're going to hybridize this stuff, or if you're going to outsource it completely, are you trying to crash test yourself secure? Right? If you're using an outsourced company to do your app software security application security testing for you, how does that impact your software development lifecycle? If the answer is it doesn't, or barely, then you're, you're addressing the wrong model. You cannot test yourself secure, I promise. All have tried, all have failed, that's why we're still here. Will budgets increase, decrease, and can you leverage your line of business? The best uh, manager I've ever had, I, I look to him as a mentor for myself, I joined his team and if one of the first things he said was, I'm going to get, basically get rid of the uh, information security budget almost completely. We, were, we all, sort of, all five of us sort of looked at him and went, um, you're crazy. But the greatest thing about that is, he was right. The line of business paid for all the security aspects. He said, you want to do business with customer X? They require PCI certification. You got to pay for that. They go, well, isn't that a security thing? He goes, nope, don't want to pay for it. I don't care if you're PCI certified or not. You do. See the genius there? Anyway, can you, write, can you have the right resources in the right positions to succeed? This is the, do you report to the right person question. If, you, if your software security assurance, the head of software security assurance reports to an operational role, forget it. Because it's a conflict of interest. You get it out there and patch it later, right? Just make the business happy. Or do you do it right? Anybody want to guess? Is the, anybody want to play some table stakes on which, one that, which one's going to win that one? 99.999% of the time? Sad but true. So step three. Intelligent process building. You don't just want to have processes for the sake of having processes. But if you don't have process, the people in the technology are a waste of time and probably a lot of money and sometimes career. Processes make success possible if you don't have a good solid process. And I'm not saying this is the end all be all, but ITIL is a great place to start. If you don't have good change management, Software security as an insurance program will fail. Guaranteed, no questions asked. Why? Because a good, the key to keeping software release cycles under check is, is at the worst case is that release step. If you can't checkpoint the release, the only thing you've got is the power of influence. And unless you've got blackmail, So don't reinvent the wheel. You probably don't have to. Unless your software development cycle is called chaos, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. What this actually turns out and it means is that 